<laughs> well, good morning, and allow me to, given that it is a parallel custom in the context of Canada to acknowledge uh, the first peoples in this land who custodians. And our university, it is in fact required not only to acknowledge the first peoples and to recognize that we stand when we speak in Winnipeg on a treaty of one land, but that we are also all treaty people, and invariably we uh, share tobacco, uh, sweet grass, and uh, occasionally have a water there, but invariably there is a presence uh, of spirituality, not traditional spirituality, that begins virtually everything in our university context. I'm also obliged and happily obliged to bring you the greetings of two Canadian organizations, the Canadian Council of Churches, which is statistically the, uh, the broadest and deepest coalition of churches in the world, making up uh, an organization that represents roughly 85% of all Christians in the Canadian context. But perhaps more importantly, to bring you the greetings of the Canadian Interfaith Conversation, which has a direct relationship to that which we are undertaking here. Thanks to Ryan Adams, to Griffith, and all the sponsors of this event. The Interfaith Conversation consists of roughly 47 interfaith and ecumenical organizations, which came together in January of 2009 in order to form the hosting body for the World Religious Leaders Summit in conjunction with the G8 meetings in Canada in 2010. One of the extraordinary domestic results of that particular exercise was the opportunity to continue to form what amounts to the first, effectively speaking, Canadian Council of Religions in history, at least in our history, of course. So it's my pleasure to bring some readings from, from that particular Bringing greetings is uh, something that I've done way too on occasion. In fact, about 10 or 12 years ago, I was asked by my colleague, the Honorable Dr. Bill Blakey, if I would take greetings to a former mentor of his, uh, Dr. Gregory Bach. Some of you may have heard of Gregory. He is an extraordinary medical theologian in the Canadian context and a fascinating individual. He reminds us from time to time of embarrassing nature of Canada's historic religious mistakes. Gregory was interned as an enemy alien along with Nazi prisoners of war because his name was Eastern European. Canada is not yet quite the nation sure that we ought to or could perhaps. Gregory's reminder of that. Bill asked me to, uh, to take greetings to Gregory to conference somewhat like this in Ottawa. Uh, and to express appreciation to Gregory for an observation that Gregory had made in the early 1970s, which had an enormous impact on Bill. Bill said that Gregory had observed that uh, the end of the, the great divide in the Christian world was not between liberal or conservative, but between those who recognized the end of Christendom and celebrated it, and those who recognized the end of Christendom and mourned it. According to that, I found myself in Ottawa speaking to Gregory and saying, by the way, you know, Blake, you want me to thank you for this observation you made. And Gregory looked at me and said, did I say that? <laughs> to which I responded, I confess, with some degree of vulgarity, how the devil should I know? I wasn't your student at the time. He said, well, if I didn't say it, I certainly wish I had. <laughs> of course, what Gregory is suggesting is that the end of Christendom means that we are required to rethink the nature of the world in which we live as Christian persons. And in fact, we have, in the Canadian context, been energetically engaged in trying to do that, particularly when it comes to the relations we have in aid and support for others around the world. The first thing we had to do was recognize that in Canada, which is the second largest geopolitical landmass on the planet, with one of the considerably smaller populations, we had to refine the chief date theory. The cheap date theory is not, of course, a theological term, but it does describe the way in which we have to work in Canada. We are a wealthy nation by comparison to many, but we are not a particularly wealthy religious nation. And one of the things that we found very quickly is that it was important not only to work together ecumenically, but to work together in an interfaith context and also in terms of a secular participation of non religious. We were really simply taking the Lund principle and expanding it somewhat. We felt that we not only ought to do a part, only those things which we could 
could not do together, but that we had to do together uh, as much as we possibly could, but we simply couldn't afford it. Part of this is a lesson from Kennedy and Winters. You learn swiftly to get along with your neighbor or you freeze to death. So we felt that it was going to be important when we dealt with one another and with the broader world to engage at an intra-faith level, an interfaith level, and with those who are in the context of the secular or inter-ideological type of worlds as well. The term that emerged from the United Church of Canada, my home denomination, is holy world ecumenism. We argue that the term ecumenate really uh, takes us back to the concept of the human community as being a part of the whole inhabited earth. And that uh, whole world ecumenism permitted us to work together with persons of faith and persons of no faith, yet all of you will for the sake of Tikkun Olam, the Jewish term that refers to the men of the world. What this has resulted in during the course of the last several decades is that coalition building has become both the norm, but also our standard, that for which we strive. Now this becomes particularly significant when we begin to look at questions of aid and support internationally. There is no question that the various religious communities in Canada, both Christian and non-Christian communities, certainly continue to engage in support directly through funding and fundraising to address questions of catastrophe, particularly catastrophe in the last half a decade or decade around issues of uh, disaster that result from climate change and its implications. But in addition to that, we have largely changed our focus in working with others abroad in terms of attempting to provide support for individuals in larger uh, communities, entire countries in some cases. We have begun to work, and really began to work this way since the early 70s, that we refer to as partners in mission. And that is to say, it has been four decades since the majority of Christian denominations in the country have sent missionaries, if you like, directly from our communities. Instead, we develop partnerships with religious organizations, secular organizations abroad, and we ask the question, what do you need from us? And consequently, we consequence, we send no one who is not actually requested by virtue of skill sets to partners overseas. We uh, provide people according to the needs that are present. And when, for example, we work in Malawi, the persons we send are uh, employees, considered employees of the organization that is on the ground in Malawi. But the third element of the work increasingly, and especially at an interfaith level, is advocacy with governments, both our own and abroad. We work on advocacy in our domestic context, especially for First Nations and Métis people, and internationally in virtually every context where there is no voice for those who require support and voice. To advocate effectively, though, we found that it's necessary to have a common language. And for us, we discovered a decade or so ago that the Rosetta Stone was to be the Millennium Development Goals, which I'm sure you're all familiar and which can easily be found on a variety of websites. The Millennium Development Goals provided us with the possibility to develop a coalition that would speak directly to world leaders in the context first of the G8 nations. And we worked with partners around the world, partners of other places and other countries, to establish a series of summits analogous to the one that in here during the course of this week on the Gold Coast. Some said we were convened in Lambeth, and Moscow, Rome, Kyoto, Sapporo, Rome, Winnipeg, Bordeaux, and Washington. From in each case, uh, from which emerged or emanated statements that were delivered directly to the religious leaders, added to the political people, gathered in the various uh, G nations. Summits. So our concern increasingly has been to maintain aid where it's available and to try to deliver it from the point of view of ecumenical and interfaith coalitions to ensure that we work in partnership with those in other parts of the world rather than assuming that we know the needs on the ground better than those persons themselves and to 
were essentially in areas of advocacy. And I suppose this stems in part from a vision that was articulated in 1944 by this British astronomer Fred Hoyle, who observed that when an image of the Earth from space was finally available, the perceptions of everyone on our planet would be changed radically forever. Four decades later, in the middle 1980s, a trauma school teacher, Henry Tyler, detective, took that vision of Fred Hoyle's and translated it into a reality in the most pre-internet days. She devised a program called Our Planet Classroom and worked through offices in New York with the World Federalist Movement to provide nothing more, which is also NASA actually, nothing more for classrooms than a picture of the Earth from space, an extraordinary blue, green, gold jewel set in the level of darkness. Thousands of schools, literally all over the world, were provided with a hard copy of the poster mailed by snail mail to now, of course, with the advent of the internet, that the project was under completed at the time, given its vast scope, its hard and important, that image was available. Now, the image, in the case of the religious communities in Canada, has simply meant that when we think now of humanism, we really do think about the whole of Canada whatever we try to do in the context of solid human solidarity, and assistance one to another, is essentially a question of nothing more than a good question. 